thank you everybody for coming. And um, Jen had asked me a couple of months ago to do a presentation on compassion fatigue. And as I was telling her, the timing was good because actually my department, the health and safety department within nurses and health professionals has been working on a set of modules on what we originally started calling a mental health training. And now we're talking about well-being. Um, and it's going to be a collection of modules, introductory, mid-level, and then train the trainer, where we're going to focus a lot on the impacts of stress and the stigma around mental illness and the need for treatment and how we as individuals and as a union can move forward with a, you know, addressing this. Because truthfully, many people in the country are dealing with a mental health crisis um, because of what we've been through. But no one deserves support more than you all because you've been through more than most folks. And even before the pandemic, you were dealing with un, unmanageable workloads and high levels of stress. So with that, let me just say that this is like the first run through on this, this module and it's not, I can't, I won't have time to talk about all of it, but uh, I wanted to share this. So I'm gonna talk about more than just compassion fatigue, but not, the whole thing where I, I'm not gonna get into um, addressing the stigma around me mental illness. And we we still have a ways to go on addressing the, the union solutions, but hopefully we'll um, have some useful information to share. And um, you know, at any time when you have a question, just sh shout out. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Okay, so my objective is basically we're going to talk about the causes of compassion fatigue and burnout and build awareness. We're going to talk a bit about stress and the impacts constant chronic stress have on our bodies and on our brain. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the individual self-care and resilience activities that one can practice. And um, I know that, you know, we all uh, have reactions to when the employer says, well, you just need to meditate more or here, we, you know, we provided a meditation room and, um, you know, you, you can get a coupon here to go, you know, for whatever self-care you think is appropriate. That's frustrating, but there are some things we can do as individuals to help take care of ourselves. And like I said, looking ahead, um, we are working on building some resources for locals so that they can try to do some things for their members who are struggling. Okay, um, I just want to say that, you know, this, this is a difficult subject and um, this should be a safe space. Anything that anyone discusses here, we should keep confidential. Um, as Jen said, this is being recorded. So I guess, um, you know, if people are Un uncomfortable with that, you, you know, you can, we can talk about it offline at another time. Um, is there anything anybody else would like to add in as far as ground rules um, or, you know, just guidance for how we talk today? Okay, if anybody thinks of anything, just please shout out, okay? Um, oops, okay, so, We've talked a little bit in the past about compassion fatigue versus burnout versus moral injury. I'm not gonna touch on moral injury today because that is another really big topic. Um, when people talk about compassion fatigue and burnout, they sometimes use the terms interchangeably and, and then someone pipes up and says, well, they're not the same. And that's true. Um, they're not exactly the same. Um, but the symptoms are very similar. Um, I guess the key difference from what I've been able to see in the research is that burnout builds up over time. It's, uh, you know, all of the chronic, everyday, frustrating, overwhelming demands that are placed on you can, over time, make it hard for you to feel like you can handle anything else. And, and I'll say that that's a pretty familiar feeling for me. 
um, that feeling of like, you know, your glass is just about empty and um, you can't give any more. If, if someone asks for one more thing, you know, you don't know what you're gonna do, but you really would like the world to stop so that, you know, you can get off the ride for just a little while so that you could take a really long nap. So compassion fatigue from what the research says is that the significant difference is that um, it can happen pretty fast. It can be, um, an ex it's, it's basically vicarious trauma and it can be a, a reaction and a normal reaction to dealing with pretty bad things um, you know, in this context at work, but it could be, um, you know, if you were volunteering as well, or, you know, in, in some kind of role like that, where you are in a role where you're providing support or care to someone and um, you're just depleted because um, the situation is so bad, you're, you're experiencing trauma as a result. So again, you know, the symptoms are fairly similar to burnout, which is why I think people sometimes use the words as synonyms. Um, you know, a feeling of, of complete exhaustion and being depleted. I think one of the key differences may be the depersonalization. I remember um, a psych nurse once telling me that uh, because of the number of assaults she had experienced, she just felt disassociated when she was with her patients. She could no longer muster the, the emotional effort to get close to her patients. She felt just rather like she was outside of her own body. So what's the you know, common denominator? I would have to say, I think it's, it's stress um, and it's chronic stress from having unreasonable demands placed on you. Um, do folks want to, you know, what are the kinds of stresses that people, like your members, if you can speak about your members, you can speak about yourself. What are some of the stresses that we deal with on a regular basis? And, you know, we are not, we are not robots. So, and we're whole people. So when I get to work some days, I'm already frustrated, right? Because I've had to get one kid on the bus. I've had to deal with uh, the other kid, and um, I won't even go into the husband, right? Um, you know, and 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 that's just me. I mean, we all are whole people. We have families. We depend on us. We may have um, elderly parents to care for. We may be dealing with financial difficulties, or just other stresses. You know, um, and it is hard not to. Well, some people are good at compartmentalizing. Um, I'm not so good at it. So if you want to shout out or we could put it in the chat, if, if Jen could um, pull up the chat and maybe, you know, what are some of the things that, that you know, make life stressful? And it can be work-related stuff. And School was put in the chat. Short, oh. short staffing. Mm -hmm. I think the cost of groceries is causing me some stress. Yeah. <laughs> Food is expensive. It is crazy expensive. I have a teenager. It eats a lot. <laughs> Illness. Oh. Yeah. 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 All right. I'll move on to the next slide, thanks. So yeah, so we are overloaded, right? And it comes from all directions. I'm trying to move this thing out of the way here. Um, so, you know, stress is a normal part of our evolutionary lives, right? You know, that, that humans evolve to have a flight, you know, um, fight or flight response to stress and um, you know that evolved in a way because that that benefited us when we were hunter gatherers and could quickly you know sort of be driven by by um, adrenaline you know when when the saber toothed tiger was headed our way um, you know and you when you know you're in a 
crisis situation, you may suddenly feel like you've got tunnel vision. All you can think about is dealing with that emergency right in front of you. You probably are really familiar with that in healthcare where like you can be laser focused on the problem right in front of you and put all of your energy into that problem, into the patient. And then when it's over with, you're exhausted. Um, you know, and in a way that kind of thing can benefit us because we can, we can deal with emergencies, we can deal with deadlines and so on, but the constant uh, impact of, of that stress can take a toll on us. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about three different stages of, of stress. And hey, Sarah, yeah. I, I am sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to validate that. Uh, two, two of the participants also put stuff in the chat and I just, oh, again, yeah. took the time to write it. So I feel like they wanted to share and we should validate yeah. it. So they they also said uh, fast paced, nonstop things to do at work in terms of things that are stressors. Um, and, and somebody else wrote, our town doesn't value us. We're underpaid school nurses. So the, mm -hmm. I think that was, these are in reaction to things that cause stresses. So yeah. Thank Sorry you. for the interruption. No, don't don't apologize. Please, please do, because I can't see anything other than the the presentation, and I can't see faces, which is one of the reasons why I miss being in person with you all. Um, so yes, and and people can you know you don't have to put it in the chat. You can, um, you know, you can shout out. You know, it's better for me to not talk the whole time, and. And uh, are there other kinds of stress people want to talk about? Okay. I can see out in the corner that Sherry is saying something, although I don't know if it's to us. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so acute stress is, again, that physiological reaction in response to, you know, some kind of emergency and Afterwards, you relax, um, you know, and it can be over time, something like moving or changing jobs where you're going through a stressful period. Um, and it can be overwhelming at the time, but it passes. Um, it doesn't last long enough to have long term impacts on your health. Episodic acute stress, though, I think is probably pretty familiar, was pretty familiar to me. Um, you know, I don't know if it sounds like anybody, you know, um, any members or people that you live with, um, when people are having too much stress and I think your jobs qualify for this and not just, you know, your jobs as healthcare workers, but as union leaders, you're constantly being called on, right? You, you have very, very long to-do lists. It can result in sort of a reactivity situation where, you know, someone contacts you and you just want to bite their head off. You're know, like, what does he want? <laughs> you know, what could possibly be asked of me more today? I'm not going to, you know, deal with that person. So, and that, you know, unfortunately can create a bad cycle of, um, more problems if you're having bad interpersonal relationships that can add more stress to the situation. So, and then there's chronic stress. And this is when your body has basically started living, living with it all the time. And it's impacting your physical health and your mental health. Um, it is, and let me catch up with what my notes say. Um, it is a lot of stuff. So, and you forget it's there, but it can impact your metabolism. Um, your blood vessels are perpetually constricted. The heart rate is elevated. Blood sugar is raised. It can cause inflammatory issues. Um, and it, you know, as you know, as well as these physical changes, it can impact your 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 mental health your performance, your relationships, and your personality. And because it is so constant, you may not even realize that things could be different, unfortunately. So 
uh, I think everybody here is familiar with cortisol and, you know, that it has good functions, but it also creates bad functions. There's the tunnel vision that I mentioned where you're really focused on a problem, um, but there are all these other impacts. So, you know, once your body releases cortisol, um, you know, you're mobilized and ready for action. The, the fight or flight uh, response creates a heightened sense of arousal, which is invigorating and, um, you know, is linked with a, a goal and it can return to normal after the completion of the task. But in situations where you're constantly under stress, your body is, is constantly producing cortisol. And distress or free-floating anxiety, um, you know, feeling anxious, uh, worried, fearful for no clear reason. The, the cortisol has no outlet. And basically your fight or flight mechanism wreaks havoc on your, your mind and your body. So, um, you know, again, ironically, our own biology, um, which was supposed to, you know, ensure our survival, sabotages us um, now that we're not running away from the tiger. So elevated cortisol levels can interfere, interfere with learning and memory. It lowers immune function and bone density. It increases blood, or um, excuse me, weight gain, blood pressure, cholesterol, and heart disease. Chronic stress and elevated cortisol levels also increase the risk for depression, memory loss, mental illness, and lower life expectancy. And studies have linked cort elevated cortisol levels to a potential trigger for mental illness and decreased resilience. Um, many researchers suspect that there's also a cognitive impact, making it more difficult to learn new material. It also has impacts on, you know, sort of your whole immune response, um, gastrointestinal problems, including ulcers, um, IBS, ulcerative colitis. It can contribute to insomnia, which of course then is not good for your health. And could it contribute to Parkinson's and other um, degenerative neurological disorders? And there's even research that shows that it could make you more prone to a work-related injury. So uh, moving on, let's name some of these stressors. Um, if you have a, a piece of paper in front of you, you might wanna take a minute to think about creating two columns, put like make a big T um, and on one side put your life and world stressors, you know, maybe um, inflation, um, climate change, the political situation, the things that are troubling you. I'm not, I don't mean to like say that you should be con upset about those things, just what the things going on in the world or with yourself, with your family, that weigh heavily on you. And then on the other side, think about the things at work that are, are really frustrating, causing you ongoing stress. Just trying to take a minute for us to think, think about it a little bit. Um, if we were in a room, we'd be doing this sort of in a group activity. I'm gonna move this over here so I can see more faces. All right. Okay, hopefully that's enough time. So I'm gonna just does, does anybody want to share some of these things? It's always kind of awkward trying to do this um, over Zoom, trying to get the kind of um, call out that we would have if we were together. So, so I'll just I'll move on to the ne next slide then and say that again. So we're working on this set of trainings, and Sarah. yeah, sorry Sarah, just popped in. Um... Just told today I have to do six. 
Oh, I forgot. That's nurses right surgery like that. That's what it means, <laughs> surgery. <laughs> I was like, you have to do SX. I'm sorry. That's terrible. <laughs> I was very trying. <laughs> that's, that's like an, like a, that's just like an abbreviation for surgery. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have to go to a new practice area that you have no experience with. No, I actually have to have surgery like on my physical body. <laughs> oh. 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 No. no. Stressful. I'm oh. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's not sure. Yeah. So again, I mean, I, I, this is, this, I think this is something I'll need to change. You know, it's not maybe so wonderful to, in isolation here, just sit here and make a list after we've already started to call out these things. But I do want to talk a little bit about the different kinds of solutions and that we as a union have been grappling with this because, you know, we, we do have one psychotherapist on staff, but we have 1.7 mem 7 million members and he can't be a therapist to all of them. Um, and frankly, like there are there are not enough providers um, throughout the country that you know, we, we all deserve to have support when we need it. Um, and it can be hard to do, especially um, in these times when the, you know, providers themselves uh, are, are feeling the impact of the, of the pandemic. I reached out a couple of months ago to a therapist that I have seen off and on over the years. And she let me know that she had a waiting list, 10 people deep. So I thought, all right, I'll just check back with her in a few months. And when I did, she let me know that she's on sabbatical. I think like she, she was experiencing compassion fatigue herself and just needed to take a break from being a therapist for a little while. So I, you know, there are not, we can't do everything, but there are some things we can do. So let me go down here. So, you know, as a union, there are some things that, are already part of our portfolio, right? We negotiate for good benefits and that can include EAP. And I know that a lot of members sometimes have concerns about EAP. You know, they just do not trust that um, somehow that information is, is kept from the employer, um, which is unfortunate because you know, the ther therapists are bound by their own code of ethics and they're not supposed to do that. But um, it's just a reality that, that members are not necessarily going to trust the employer provided EAP. Um, in this process of trying to figure out the trainings, we talked a lot about providing training to locals for how to set up um, peer support groups. Um, in the end, we decided that that is not something we're going to advocate for. There are two schools of thought on this, you know, um, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. They don't require there to be uh, like a, a certified um, psychologist or social worker or someone like that to lead the group. They're simply peer led support groups. Other groups, so. Um, are led by someone who has the training and, and frankly, the liability insurance <laughs> to be able to lead people through discussions of, you know, really heavy issues, including addictions, um, you know, significant mental illnesses. Um, and, and so in the end, we decided we're not gonna provide a, a, a blueprint for our locals for creating peer support groups, but that is, something that people can turn to and the union can provide resources on like here, here are the local peer support groups in our community. Um, they, we can address public awareness campaigns. Um, we can, and we can try to address the stigma. These are short term things. Longer term things are of course bargaining, bargaining for good benefits so that people can get to a, a licensed provider when they need to. Um, legislation, such as the staffing legislation you all have been working on. Um, legislation against mandatory overtime, against um, quick turnaround shifts, you know, when people have 
less than eight hours between shifts and don't get enough sleep. Other policies. Um, yep, someone have something to say? Hi there, it's Dana. Sorry, the camera's off, I'm cooking yep. dinner. Um, but um, one of the things that's a big stressor, you mentioned um, having good benefits. And one of the big stressors I see with the school nurses is that we don't actually have good benefits. We have high cost insurance with high deductibles, high out of pocket expenses. We also have unpaid FMLA. And to qualify for unpaid FMLA, which most of us can't afford to do, um, you can't be absent from work in a complete year more than 10 times. And the people who go out on FMLA, it's, it is being utilized by people more so, not the ones who are sick because they don't qualify because they already missed more than 10 days. So, I mean, we have to be able to distinguish good benefits. Not all of us have those. Okay. Yeah. And those sound like areas. Are you, are you as school nurses, part of the, the teacher's unit or are you in a separate bargaining unit? So we're, we're part of the teacher's contract, but we bargain separately. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, um, yeah. I, so there are definitely things to work on to improve. And I appreciate you sharing that information. And I, I, Try not to make assumptions about what members have, um, but sometimes I speak in, in general terms. And yeah, so those those are definitely things, you know, things that need to be improved, you know, in the future in bargaining, as well as perhaps some legislative campaigns. Thank you. Oh yeah, well, thank you for sharing. So there are, you know, I did not make this list. This is this list doesn't make a whole lot of sense in this context. But you know, and obviously we talk a lot in health and safety about la labor management committees. That's another tool that we can use for improving working conditions. Um, I'm going to skip down to the next one. So going back to something I said earlier, um, I know that members have reactions to this. I have reactions myself. You know. It, if we were not a union, all we, you know, would need to say is, you know, do, you know, Google mindfulness or, or, you know, go down to the grocery store and pick up a copy of Prevention Magazine or Women's Day or whatever, you know, and you can find an article on self-care. And sometimes those articles are more about, you know, getting a facial and a manicure and sometimes they're they're more helpful. Um, so I want to make sure I put this into the right context that um, self care, especially if it's coming from the employer saying you just need to do do better at taking care of yourself, that's incredibly off putting, and um, kind of well, I don't want to say disempowering. It it doesn't reflect how we want our members to, to look at the world. We are all in this together, but there are some things that only we can do for ourselves. Um, we as individuals have to take a minute and, and think about how we're feeling um, and be in charge of figuring out what, what might happen differently, how we can change things. So um, let me just make sure that I'm not missing. All right, so relaxation exercise. I'll, I'll say again, like sometimes when I hear this stuff and somebody says, oh, I meditate every morning or, you know, you should practice mindfulness. I, I think, well, that's just ridiculous. Like, you know, I have a very, very busy day. I don't know when I'm going to find time to add that, you know, and you're just giving me one more thing to do, right, <laughs> frankly. You know, rather than, uh, you know, offering me, uh, you know, a way to take something off my list, it's putting something else on my list. Um, but 
these things have actually been shown to work. Um, and, you know, we don't necessarily have to reach perfection. Um, I needed, let me, I'll put these in at the, at the end. I've got some links for some breathing exercises and some meditation exercises. And of course, there are many apps that are available. There are lots of videos on YouTube, um, some of them better than others. Um, but I have learned that um, intentional breathing can help me to calm down. Um, when you, you take a deep breath, you hold it um, for, let, there are different ways of doing this. Some people call it box breathing where you hold, hold the breath, like you breathe in on five, you breathe out on five, uh, or you hold it for five, then you breathe out on five. Intentionally breathing like that over a few minutes just sort of helps your body to take in more oxygen. Your brain starts to receive that oxygen and you start to relax. You're not in that um, primitive part of the brain where you're um, just wanting to escape. Um, so those are some things that you can do. When we publish this set of trainings, we're gonna have uh, a resource booklet that goes with it. And it will include just a link that locals can put on their website so that people can have access to that information as well as access to information about where to go for, for help. So another thing that we can do, and again, you know, this can be frustrating for people if, if they are, you know, say they're a nurse who has little kids at home and they've got elderly parents to take care of as well or something and they've got uh, just a jam-packed day suggesting that people take time out for themselves can be very frustrating but you know I have I have found and I th other people have found that if you take some time where you are doing something intentionally for yourself um, where you are slowing down you're paying attention to your breathing or you're doing something that engages your brain in something that is different from the worries that are running around in your head, it can be helpful. So for some people that's running or walking, um, for, for some people it's gardening, um, it could be as simple as just, um, you know, petting your dog and <laughs> just having, you know, relaxing in that way. So, um, I'll put some links in at the end for relaxation exercises. So then this is, this is my, well, I didn't create this slide, but this, this is, um, if, if I had made this slide, the cat would not be holding the, the booze. He would be holding uh, some cookies or some other carbs that, that he should not be having. No reaction. This, this this slide got a lot of reaction from the other group. <laughs> oh well. So there there are lots of unhealthy ways of um, blocking out our our stress, right? Um, excessive gaming, um, withdrawal from family and friends, um, too much screen time, um, all of these things. So. You know, everything in moderation. I mean, you know, obviously having a drink once in a while, uh, you know, engaging in something that might not be the best for you might, you know, once in a while is fine, but if it's a way of numbing your brain, it, it isn't helpful in the end for us. So as I mentioned, I, I'm going to be working on this resource document that is going to have a couple of different tiers. It's going to include um, links for how to find how to find therapy, um, how to you know find out you know if, if you're seeking it for someone who doesn't have good benefits, how to find therapy for them, how to find peer support groups, um, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, hotlines and warm lines. Warm lines are. Um, Phone, you know, phone lines that are staffed with people who are um, have lived experience of whatever the issue is. So maybe they're in recovery, 
maybe they have the same diagnosis and you know it could be a a phone line for people with schizophrenia for example that kind of thing so i would be remiss if i didn't include this because this is something that is unique to aft and something that we um, are always wanting to let our members know it um, has a couple of different components um, the aft trauma benefit the first part is absolutely free for our members um, once you go through the, the sessions that are free there's the option to purchase at a very low rate i I want to say it's like $16 a month to continue that therapy. You could also purchase that therapy for family members. Um, so it's it's online, um, you know, which actually these days, I think a lot of therapists are just practicing online, even if, you know, you are in the same town. That's just how that's working these days. But um, this is something that we hope all of our locals promote and let folks know that that they have access to this. So let me just flip ahead in my notes here a little bit. Talk about this. Um, so the idea that we're going to be promoting and we have to um, flesh out better is creation of member support advocacy committees or volunteers. Um, originally, we were calling it navigators. I, I had found out that in the past, PEF had used a program called workers comp navigators. And the idea was, was that there would be stewards, for example, who got special training for helping members who were out on um, injury leave helping them to navigate the workers' comp system. So um, that exact model didn't work out for PEF. They, they changed it somewhat, but this is a similar idea. So it, it's either a committee or it is um, uh, you know, a couple of individuals who receive special training. They can become really familiar with the resources that are available in the community. Um, you know, where the peer support groups are, um, lists of, of, you know, therapy providers, um, how to use uh, the, the, the insurance to access therapy, you know, if you have to submit um, the other resources that are in the community in terms of peer support groups, stuff like that. It could also go in a different direction if people are interested because a lot of us are experiencing a lot of loneliness and a lot of isolation. Um, the Surgeon General, in fact, just came out with a report on loneliness being a really major factor in our mental health crisis these days. We, um, compared to in the past, I remember, you know, when my grandparents were around and when they were in their prime, they were members of the Masons and Eastern Star. And of course, you know, in, in our church, um, you know, in civic club and stuff like that, people um, in earlier generations were generally joiners. And of course, we're in, in a union because we know that it, it is the smart thing to do to work together and that together we have much more power than we have as individuals. Um, but we often, and when I said we, like many of us in this country these days are operating on our own far too much. So that is a long winded sermon to say like, hey, what if the union had uh, a committee that just did some social things? Um, you know, and it can be hard, hard to get started, but you know, what if there's a potluck um, group, you know, like a group that, you know, sponsors a potluck once a month or bowling, or gardening, or volunteering at the soup kitchen, or um, you know, fill in the blank, some kind of social activity that helps us to become better connected with our, our union sisters and brothers um, and our community. So these are all just suggestions. I mean, not to you know sound preachy about it or 
you know, put one more thing on your already very long to-do lists. These were just ideas we were trying because again, we can't, we can't provide individual therapy for everybody, um, but we can try to figure out some, some scalable solutions for how we um, address the ongoing stress and trauma that so many of our members are facing. So um, let, I think I'm almost at the end here. Yeah. Oh, so here are some other things. And this goes to um, what um, I'm blanking on your name. Unfortunately, the school nurse was talking about um, FMLA being applied in a way that's not helpful. I, in fact, I do wonder, I mean, FMLA is federal, so I'm just wondering how it is that they can it, um, place those conditions on it, but I am not an expert on FMLA. We don't, we don't qualify for the federal because we don't pay into it. I see. We just have district FMLA. Oh, so it didn't, it didn't apply to public employees? Correct. Okay. All right. So these are some other things that locals can do in terms of, you know, working toward real, real actual things that can benefit members in terms of um, benefits and um, ways of getting support. Um, I don't know how many people have heard the, of the Mental Health Parity Act. It was passed in 2008 and then it was strengthened under the Affordable Care Act. Um, healthcare plans are supposed to treat mental illness and physical illness equitably in terms of like, you know, you should be able to get the same amount of, of um, benefits, for lack of a better word, for mental health and substance use needs as you would for diabetes or cancer or any other physical illness. It's not well enforced. So that is something that um, this committee could take on is, is um, checking on that and then reporting to the bargaining committee that, hey, you know, we have a lot of concerns about um, people's level of access to mental health benefits under our current um, insurance package. Um, so those are just some examples of things that unions can work on. And again, I'm sorry I keep referring to this um, as yet in development um, program, but we will be getting that stuff out um, sometime in the summer. So um, this is one of our last things. You know, it is very hard for us to talk about these issues, although we've come a long way compared to in the past. Um, people are, I would say some people are more open uh, talking about diagnoses, um, talking about family members who died by suicide, um, substance use issues within our families. Um, so this is a good thing. And it's also a generational thing. Um, we, you know, you may have noticed that young people are much more open to the world and maybe sometimes a little too open on social media about their situations that, you know, they will tell folks, I have bipolar or I have ADHD, um, you know, whereas my grandparents' generation, my grandparents lost a son to suicide and they never talked about it ever, ever, um, and never went to therapy, which of course, you know, wasn't, you know, what just was not available to them anyway, but had it been available to them, I'm not sure they would have been open to trying it. So, you know, I think it's it's really, we've, we've had a lot of progress in the last few years with um, addressing stigma around mental health and substance use issues. But that said, we still have a long way to go. Um, and it's um, something we all, you know, can try to show compassion for. So I think that, yep, that's that's the last. Let me exit the, the share and stop talking at.